International Political Sociology, 2024, 18, Cocktails, Race, Sex, and Enjoyment in the Reactionary Memescape, UYGALBASPEHLIVAN, University of Bristol. UK this article makes a critical contribution to the study of digital reactionary movements by tracing the resonant circulation of the cuck memes across various levels of racialized and gendered subjectivity. It argues that the cuck meme resonates through composing an effective narrative of deferred and stolen enjoyment at the intersection of personal, social, and international politics. It follows the memes digital movements across pornographic anxieties around the sexual price of the black other, the personal, the gummigut events of 2014 and its politics of geek, masculine injury, the social, and the perceived threat of immigration to the enjoyment space designated as the nation, the international. Throughout, the paper makes three contributions. First, it theorizes the structuring role played by enjoyment as a political factor in historically shaping political subjectivity. Second, it shows how this political factor animates the transnational politics of contemporary reactionary movements and how they effectively and discursively perceive their various political resentments through narratives of enjoyment. Third, it demonstrates how memes as specific technical aesthetic products allow the common resonance and articulation of these various resentments to shape a site of rectification for an enjoyment that is felt to be lost. Introduction. Over the last decade, internet memes have become significant popular cultural sites for the increasingly tangible and transnational presence of digital reactionary politics. Green 2019, Woods and Hana 2019, through their ephemeral, horizontal, and effective circulations across and outside social media platforms, these aesthetically non-serious products have been contributing to the digital coming together of a multiplicity of political subjects to accelerate a rising reactionary sensibility, animating various racialized and gendered resentments in the process. Was relevant 2024, the resentments that these digital artifacts have been evoking, importantly do not simply remain impactful in mediating various personal, social, and domestic political issues. Crucially, they have also been reflecting the ways in which the international, as a broad level of global political concerns, is effectively perceived and discursively interpreted by this emergent composite of reactionary subjectivities. Reactionary memes, today, intervene into and shape the everyday and popular perceptions of various international political issues, immigration, citizenship, nationalism, etc. To Pinker 2018, these perceptions, furthermore, do not simply circulate domestically, but, as Kosmaravi Oriad, 2023, argues, engender the formation of mimetic alliances that cultivate and circulate transnational reactionary sensibilities across a multiplicity of political actors from varying nationalities, in moving and mutating across divergent sites of power. Therefore, reactionary memes work to connect the personal, the social, and the international, as well as the local and the global, the connective relation between the personal, the social, and the international in. The composition of this reactionary meme politics has not yet been put into significant theoretical and empirical consideration, while extant studies of the relation ship between memes and reactionary politics often focus on how such products are weaponized instrumentally by populist or far-right actors to manipulate and toxify a seemingly apolitical public, Weber 2016, 14, analyses that critically interrogate why such memes and reactionary sensibilities effectively resonate for particular political subjects in the first place and how such resonances bring together varying levels of politics remain relatively rare. Dean 2019, Bratich 2022, Katia et al. 2022, in this paper, I ask a series of questions to think through these problems. What makes a meme tick? How do reactionary memes traverse and connect various resentments to accelerate emergent reactionary desires? How do these traversals relate to and draw from wider socio-effective histories and structures of race and gender? To critically attend to these questions, 
This paper explores the transversal politics of one of the more widespread and influential digital mimetic expressions of contemporary reactionary politics, the cuck. To do so, it follows and maps the effective and discursive positions this meme circulates across various personal, social, and international issues. The cuck, derivative of the medieval term cuckold, is a figure that refers to a man who is being cheated on by his wife, often with someone deemed to be superior to him. Its mimetic circulation originated from the pornographic fetish category, which predominantly involves scenes of white women having sex with masculine, idealized black men in front of their degraded, weakened, white husbands locked 2019. Mutating from there on, the meme became significantly popular in the equally pornographic reactionary image boards of 4chan, starting with the misogynistic Gamagat saga, Know Your Meme 2015, it later enjoyed a popularity peak during the 2016 electoral campaign of Donald Trump with variations on the meme, conservatives and libcucks becoming popular insults against political opponent Schwartz 2016, to the extent of even being used by the former White House chief strategist Steve Bannon. Today, the meme has become an integral and even a mainstream component of contemporary reactionary digital lexicons. It is, perhaps, the alt-right's most popular insult Ogilvy 2023. In fact, it was only very recently when the world's richest and most meme-addicted billionaire Elon Musk called his rival Mark Zuckerberg a cuck. Madoi 2023. In its everyday usage, the cuck mediates a series of concerns for international concerns, resentful speculations about whether a particular nation or race is being cut by refugees and migrants can be found across various digital reactionary spaces as a latent index of white genocide paranoias and great replacement conspiracies. Cost 2022. Socially, liberal stroke leftist men who become designated as work or as a social justice warrior SJW are now quickly marked with the cuck epithet, structuring rising reactionary concerns around degraded masculinities that threaten normative nationalities and civilizational values. Economically, the meme mutates with the added prefix, the Wajikuk, Van Shen, 2023, defining a humiliated white working stroke middle class man whose economic futures are supposedly drained by the increasing presence of others in the labor force, women, racial, minorities, migrants, etc. The cuck meme, it seems, is a varying yet resonant glue that brings together a multiplicity of contemporary concerns, sites, and political subjects across a wide spectrum of reactionary politics. While on the surface, it may refer to a simple othering device to be deployed against those who are perceived as inferior men, however, I contend that its widespread and resonant circulation in fact gestures toward a more complicated relationship between race, enjoyment, and masculinity, which is mediated through the meme. It illuminates how a historical mode of white, masculine subjectivity, and its attending anxieties digitally circulate through the meme and how this circulation expresses a common reactionary sensibility, resonating across the personal, the social, and the international. My central argument is that the cuck meme resonates through composing an effectively resonant narrative of deferred and stolen enjoyment across transversal sites of racialized and gendered resentment. This resentment starts from the personal site of sexual relations, then extends to the social site of gaming communities, and then becomes more internationally articulated through the sense that the collective enjoyment associated with the nation is being deferred and stolen by the presence of migrants and refugees. The meme, I argue, allows these three sites to come together to articulate a common space of reactionary resentment. To structure this argument, I use effect as a methodology to map how effective and discursive structures of enjoyment become political in composing various racial, gendered, and sexual relationalities. A whole 2018, in doing so, I look at the micro-political Solomon and Steele 2017 and everyday Guillaume 2011 circulation of these effective discursive structures both in historical archives as well as their contemporary digital manifestations in the cut to uncover how a felt loss 
of enjoyment resonates across times and space as a political reaction. The content of this loss of enjoyment, I argue, also informs the ways in which the transgressive fun, you do per 2019, of online reactionary politics becomes desirable to these subjects in the first place, to the extent that reactionary memes may be felt as threatening, degrading, and excluding for those they target, their humorous and or vulgar circulation supplies the effective promise of enjoyment to those whom they resonate with. Effect, as Jason Reed argues, is inherently ambivalent, both capable of holding contradictory sentiments together as well as capable of resonating quite divergently among varying subjectivities. 2015, 31, see also Parsonen, 2023, the collective enjoyment provided by digitally mediated reaction, it can be, argued, ambivalently compensates for the lack of enjoyment felt and articulated, through the meme, McGowan 2022, in that regard, the meme works doubly, both, in the ways in which a lack of enjoyment is circulated in content and the ways in, which it is seemingly compensated through the violent and excessive enjoyment of racial and gendered resentment Anderson and Sequel 2022. Consequently, the paper makes three contributions. First, it theorizes the structuring role played by enjoyment as a political factor in historically shaping political subjectivity at the intersecting levels of personal, social, and international. Second, it shows how this intersection animates the transnational politics of contemporary reactionary movements and how they effectively and discursively perceive the political resentments they articulate around issues of nationality, migration, race, and gender through enjoyment. Third, it demonstrates how memes are specific technical aesthetic products in moving across these levels allow the common resonance and articulation of these resentments to shape a site of rectification for an enjoyment that is felt to be lost. In order to carry out such an analysis, there are certain methodological and ethical implications that need to be considered first. As memes are ephemeral, mutative, and often anonymous phenomena, their academic study does not follow a straightforward formula. When this study involves memes that comprise fundamentally racist and sexist premises and violent stroke vulgar language, additional ethical questions arise as well. Vaughan et al. 2024. What I call a reactionary memescape is not a contained space or a platform with set characteristics. Instead, I situate it as a relational space through which far-right, racist, and sexist mimetic articulations discourses and affects circulate across a multiplicity of platforms and sites of interaction, from vulgar image boards such as 4chan and 8 counter spaces with broader and more mainstream usage such as Reddit, Twitter, and Facebook. I collected my material through engaging with this reactionary memescape, starting with the search engine keyword cuck and other related keywords on these various sites and then hopping from platform to platform link to link, and thread to thread as new and relevant connections appeared, I have archived a host of relevant images and texts that allowed me to have an insight into the emergent logics and effective resonances that circulated through these channels. Sarah Sama, 2016, calls this process reverse snowballing as a method of collecting and considering relevant digital data as they accumulate toward the researcher, combining These archival extractions with further digital ethnographic observations that came from longer-term engagement with these sites as well as reading through relevant historical and theoretical material, I identified various tendencies that shine a light into the political formation of contemporary digital reactionary subjectivities. These tendencies, though not wholly representative of the dynamics of these spaces, offer insight into the relationship between enjoyment sex, and racial and gendered for machines that become resonant across reactionary politics. This insight, it can also be argued, faces the inevitable digital culture methodology challenge of just joking, where the lines between intention and appearance are ever muddled through the ambivalent deployment of irony as a rhetorical mode. Phillips and Milner 2017, however, the jokeness and the non-seriousness of these Expressions are the very point of this analysis. To understand, laugh with, or share, a joke requires a common set of cultural and political values. 
meanings, and refer. Ends points. Crucially, the enjoyment of humor requires a consonance between the joke and the beliefs of the audience. Adams, 2018, 113. In circulating through the joke, the memes reveal a set of common resonances that move the imaginaries of a specific set of political subjects and as such, inform us as to their effective conditions of action. I recognize the need to be cautious in circulating and potentially amplifying the images and texts that are analyzed in the paper, in addition to obtaining ethical approval from my institution to conduct said research, as most of the images and content archived are from primarily anonymous image boards and accounts or from meme encyclopedias such as Know Your Meme, and as interacting with anonymous reactionary actors can be both dangerous and counterproductive fooks. 2018, it can be argued that there is assumed assent to analyze this material. In one case where an image was directly taken from a non-anonymous Twitter account, I considered the wide reach and popularity of the account as clear evidence of publicness. To minimize the risk of harm in the academic circulation of these images, we are placing the images in question in a separate appendix for the reader's discretion. While risks of amplification are always present in the study of material of this nature, in the end, their critical and considered analysis provides significant and politically crucial insights into uncovering the underlying mechanisms and logics of contemporary reactionary politics. Jester 2023, this paper's argument aims to offer one avenue into such a project of uncovering, to build this argument. I first look at the memes trifold distribution of enjoyment that is imagined to be unfolding between the imaginary figures of the weak, cuck, the racialized bull, and the empowered wife. Then, inspired by the work of black feminist and Afro-pessimist scholars such as Sadia Hartman, 1997, Cheryl Harris, 1993, and Frank Wilderson III, 2020, I trace the racial and sexual history of enjoyment as a productive site of subject making in the West, especially in the United States, and the intimate ways in which whiteness and masculinity are structured around an expected and normative right to enjoy. Afterward, I explore how this very historically structured right to enjoy and its perceived loss animates the effective resonance of the cuck meme and its wide-ranging circulation across three sites, the pornographic anxieties around the sexual prize of the black other, the personal, the gummigut events of 2014 and its politics of geek masculine injury, the social, and the perceived threat of immigration to the enjoyment space, designated as the nation the international. In navigating these transversal resonances, I demonstrate the socio-effective power of enjoyment as a political factor in animating reactionary politics, a factor significantly under-examined in international relations, and show the ways in which the memescape accelerates and assembles this politics. The wife, the cuck, and the bull. The mimetic figure of the cuck is structured around a specifically gendered and racial relationship to enjoyment. Its aesthetic imaginary is composed of a man who defers the sexual enjoyment that he normatively ought to obtain from his wife to others. It is often imagined that this figure is unable to satisfy his partner sexually, or otherwise, which leads her to seek, either with the husband's consent or not, enjoyment with other men who are perceived to be better. In the recent popular pornographic depictions of these cuckold relationships, which most likely became the inspiration for the meme, this better man that receives the enjoyment is primarily depicted as a sexually dominant and potent black man, Lock 2019, 212. This particular distribution of enjoyment comprises the racist and sexist premise of the cuck memes. The cuck emerges as an image of masculine failure in his inability to enjoy as well as in his potential willingness to defer that right of enjoyment to others, often defined racially. The composition of the meme thus distributes enjoyment across three figures. One, the feminine figure who enjoys the company of the racialized other, the wife. Two, the man, often depicted as racially other, who enjoys the company of the feminine figure, the bull. And three, the weak, often white man who defers his enjoyment to the pleasure of others, the cuck. This composition becomes a template for expressing various political relations to 
enjoyment that are articulated around the anxious absence of an enjoyment that is desired to be a normative given. Importantly, in these circulations, the cut does not remain as a clear and stable sign with a determined point of reference. Instead, it is operationalized, ambivalently, referring and relating to multiple and often contradictory realities at once. Crucially, the cuck is somehow both the identified self and the degraded other. While most analyses of the cuck see it as a denigrating term that is used to mock others, some variations on the meme emerge as complex identifiers for self-expression. This is most evident in online incel communities where the cuck is often used as a self-descriptor to name the type of masculinity the men feel they have. Johansson 2022, 188. The cup is degraded other is a figure of humiliation. A weak man who willingly defers his enjoyment for the pleasure of others. The cuck, as the identified self, on the other hand, is a figure of resentment. A person who is not a cuck but cucked of his enjoyment by feminism, by the government, by multiculturalism, by cultural Marxism, etc. This self-identificatory gesture, in fact, refers both to the individual self and also to the collective self, i.e., the nation or the race. Why are white people the most cupped groups to ever exist? Asks an anonymous poster on 4chan's politically incorrect. Paul, bored, black steel all the white women, Mexican steal all the easy minimum wage jobs, PS and CS, steal all the STEM field jobs, anonymous 2017A. In this post, the cup is no longer defined through interpersonal relationships of enjoyment but as a collective signifier for the socio-effective condition of white people as cupped by a variety of other cultural groups. Its distribution of enjoyment, furthermore, does not only involve sexual enjoyment of white women, but also wage jobs and STEM field jobs. That is, enjoyment defined in other terms. The cuck meme, therefore, is an adaptable repository of expressions. It is capable of resonating across multiple ambivalent forms of identification and composing how these identifications will relate to its imagined distributions of enjoyment. In particular, in its particular distribution, it mutatively circulates to assemble a networked sense that enjoyment is being stolen, right to enjoy, histories of race, whiteness, and enjoyment. The socio-digital space of the memescape is a political site that is haunted by structural and historical constitutions of subjectivity, while memes, in their comic and subversive aesthetics, may offer possibilities of resistance and transformation. The effective mechanisms through which they are enjoyed often also reflect and reproduce differential systems of power whereby racialized, gendered, and politicized subjects are invested in. That is, as all affective relations, the resonant enjoyment of a meme does not emerge in a vacuum but rather through the geohistoricity of the body, comma, in the manner in which capacities have been formed through past encounters that repeat with variation in the habits repertoires, and dispositions of bodies Anderson 2016, 85, to investigate how and why a meme, especially ones that produce and circulate reactionary sensibilities, resonates. Therefore, we first trace the historical and structural mechanisms that produce subjects that connect with its effective and discursive premise. The widespread reactionary resonance of the cuck meme, I argue, can be genealogically traced back to a particular socio-political production of whiteness and masculine subjectivity structured around an expected and normative right to enjoy the world. The repeated pattern of this normative expectation, I contend, resonates transhistorically across various formations of race and gender, from violent impositions of colonial and slave economies. Stola 2006, to the supposedly post-racial and colorblind liberal consensus of the 20th and 21st centuries, Vanilla Selva 2015, in her book Scenes of Subjection, Sadia Hartman, 1997, observes that a differential distribution of enjoyment held a privileged position in the articulation and effective machinery of white subjectivity in antebellum United States, in which the Everyday self-understandings and social relations of white and black people were inextricably entangled in the structural formations of chattel and colonial economies. 
from the vantage point of the everyday relations of slavery, she argues, enjoyment, broadly speaking, define the parameters of racial relations, since in practice all whites were allowed a great degree of latitude in regard to uses of the enslaved, 23, reflecting the material and infrastructural basis of racial capitalist slave economies, Hartman argues, the relationship of white slave owners to the commodified black slaves was enshrined on a legal, institutional, and cultural right to enjoy. This right not only undergirded the political and economic position of whiteness, she puts, but was also performed in quantity and spectacles and performances that set the stage for the effective formation of white subjectivity. Blacks were envisioned fundamentally as vehicles for white enjoyment, in all of its sundry and unspeakable expressions, this was as much the consequences of the chattel status of the captive as it was of the excess enjoyment imputed to the other, for those forced to dance on the decks of slave ships crossing the middle passage, step it up lively on the auction block, and amuse the master and his friends were as the purveyors of pleasure. Hartman 1997, 23. This right to enjoyment ranged from the violent right to sexually enjoy the racialized other through rape and harassment, Stola 1989, as well as a right to laugh at and be amused by the perceived inferiority of the other Perez 2022 enjoyment in the case of the racial economy, thus, was an infrastructural property relation. Harris 1993, setting the social and everyday practices of whiteness and blackness, this material infrastructural claim was also an effective claim. Bosworth 2023, fundamentally, when you own or become entitled to a particular object through a property relation, you also make a claim to the socio-effective right to derive enjoyment from it. This relationship does not only mediate relations between subjects, but also a subject's relationship to their spatial vicinity, that is, their right to enjoy space, in Shannon Sullivan's phenomenological analysis of the embodied effective spatiality of white subjectivity, for instance, expectations and fantasies of whiteness come with a presumed right to spatially extend one's body freely and autonomously, 2006, 10, which derives from a historic racial schema Ahmed 2007, through Fallon, 2008, rooted in histories of colonialism. This particular formation of whiteness is structured in and through relations of property Walcott 2021, not only on black, people but also on the wider territorial colonial spaces over which their rights were enshrined, thus entailed and entails a socio-effective right to enjoy. This property relation certainly is not only inter-personal but extends to communal relations, to national relations, and to international relations. That is, this understanding of property distributes which groups have the right to enjoy which space is able to consume what and how. This distribution, necessarily, also implies a consideration and consolidation of who does not hold this right, structures of enjoyment, as property relations and as socio-effective formations of subjectivity, are subsequently also distributed along lines of inclusion and exclusion. Following Zizek, Hartman thus proposes that fantasies about the other's enjoyment are ways for us to organize our own enjoyment, 25 the enjoyment of structural whiteness, therefore depends on how the enjoyments of others are imagined, delimited, and constructed. Whiteness, or white subjectivity, is inextricably connected, both discursively and effectively, to an entitled right to enjoy the world, both as a property, relation, a spatial relation, and a relation of exclusion. While Hartman's analysis limits its scope to the relationship between the Slavia winner and the enslaved in antebellum United States, the continuities between this historical construction of subjectivity and the ways it haunts contemporary formations of racial subjectivity can be observed in multiple contexts. In his autobiographical book Afropessimism, for instance, Frank Wilderson III, 2020, recounts a scene of encounter between him, his then partner Stella, and a white neighbor, Josephine. Josephine, an educated, progressive woman often barges in, without knocking or without consideration of Stella and Frank's privacy, to enjoy their company, their friendly space, and their conversation. Wilderson says that she feels entitled to this, as it is libidinally 
and structurally within her rights, 73, to barge in and to demand to be entertained. One night, after Stella and Frank start to feel increasingly threatened for their lives because of their revolutionary activities with the Black Panther Party, they hear someone entering their apartment, thinking they will be murdered. They soon realize it is Josephine, looking for company. When pushed back against her intrusion, Josephine becomes visibly confused, offended, and threatened. I'm not here for your amusement, Stella says and demands her to leave. In response, Josephine raises her voice so that they could all hear and says, Are you threatening me? First you assault me, now you're threatening me, 84. Wilderson argues that this was an encounter that was inevitable, even prefigured, in the particular libidinal and structural economy of race relations in the United States. The source of Josephine's resentment, according to Wilderson, was being denied enjoyment, which she saw as her structural right. An object meant merely for the pleasure of possession had gazed back at a human subject, 83. Otherwise a progressive figure, Josephine's felt theft of enjoyment, Wilderson argues, stages a quantity and racial encounter that demonstrates the imminent tension between whiteness as a structured promise and expectation of enjoyment and its denial by a racialized other reclaiming their autonomous existence. Theft of enjoyment in this encounter is both social and libidinal. It is an effective reaction and effectively reactionary. In his psychoanalytic analysis of racist subjectivity, Slavoj Zizek argues that the socio-psychological composition of racism can be read through the Lacanian notion of theft of enjoyment, which rests on the imaginary of different modes of libidinal enjoyment, or, more specifically yet, the perception that my own precious mode of enjoyment has been stolen by others in possession of an illicit or malignant enjoyment. Hook 2022, 35, Zizek, 1993, argues, crucially, that these libidinal perceptions of enjoyment theft do not only structure how the various others are imagined but also are effective clues that fundamentally bring together and compose the self and the nation and all the race. Put more succinctly, he argues, a fantasy of theft of enjoyment is the condition of possibility for how the self and the collective can be enjoyed in the first place. 204. These fantasies of threat often take the form of a racialized other whose excess enjoyment rep resents either a biological condition, e.g., the black other's sexual potency, or a cultural condition, e.g., the Muslim other's queer perversion, poor 2017. The reactionary imaginations of the collective self often derive from the fantasy of taking this enjoyment back from perverted others. Recent slogans of populist nationalist movements such as Make America Great Again and Take Back Control, for instance, derive their fantasies of restoration from a felt right to enjoy the nation, which has supposedly been stolen away by various racialized others, refugees, illegal immigrants, ETC, who now enjoy the nation more than the so-called rightful owners, Mandelbaum 2020, the fantasy of this threat, which itself becomes a sight of momentary collective enjoyments through chanted slogans or widely circulating memes, fosters the solidarity of the community, consolidates national identity, and animates national desire. Stavrakakis and Chisalorus 2006. 153. The cuck meme, I argue, resonates in the reactionary memescape, as it memetically composes a theft of enjoyment narrative. Within this particular composition, the race relation combines intimately with gender as another distribution of enjoyment. As with whiteness, it can be argued that masculinity structures itself around a similar expectation and right of enjoyment, particularly the enjoyment of the objectified feminine other. Within patriarchal societies, for example, women are often structured as objects of enjoyment, and men who are unable to enjoy them are often considered failed masculine subjects, that is, beta men or the cucks. Insofar, as both race and gender are structures of enjoyment, the imagined and perceived loss of this enjoyment often emerges as a powerfully resonant narrative. The aesthetics and discursive politics of this loss reverberate historically in the repeated construction of racial others as sexual threats to enjoyment in the United States, for example, from the depictions of black men as rapists in popular media, 
such as D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, in 1915 to the Lethal and Grissom Lynch. I'm a 14-year-old Emmett Till for flirting with a white woman in 1950, the black. Other is a constant figure of enjoyment threat, as can be seen in Klaus Thuerlitz. 1987, archival extractions from fascist Europe, the same imagery repeats in World War I. In his book Male Fantasies, 1987, Thuerlitz uncovers multiple propaganda posters that depict grinning, Strong figurations of black men as enjoying themselves in sex, UAL and graphic relation to white women. In one poster, Fuelite 1987, 94. For instance, the naked, muscular body of a giant black man towering over a small Italian town takes the center visual stage as he holds the lifeless bodies of a mass of naked white women in his arms. Within the visual imagination of the poster, the Military invasion of the town as national territory intersects with the enjoyment of the black man. In another Italian poster, 96, similarly, a black U.S. soldier, with a massive smile on his face, is depicted as groping the marble sculpture of a naked white woman, the famous Venus de Milo. A marking on her body reads $2. The interaction with the enjoying black soldier supposedly cheapens her. The poster both reiterates a sexual threat while also restaging it as a civilizational threat to the achievements of the European civilization. In both depictions, the feminine bodies are lifeless, even commodified, vessels for a racialized anxiety of enjoyment theft. In her analysis of rape narratives in the Serbian-Bosnian War, Lena Hansen discovers a similar story, arguing that raping the nation's women was not only con- Instituted as an act of violence against individual women, it also worked to install a disempowered masculinity as constitutive of the identities of the nation's men. 2060. In the context of Indian Hindu nationalism, which significantly constitutes itself in its proximity to whiteness and Aryanism, Berkford 2020, Dibyesh, Anand, 2007, on the other hand, uncovers the anxious masculinities of Hindu men against the perceived sexual virility of Muslim minority men. Today, we also find these narratives surface transnationally across the issue of international immigration, from discourses around the Cologne Christmas events in Germany, Bulala, and Carried 2017, to the rise of anti-Syrian, Ostersen et al. 2021, and anti-black sexual discourses in Turkish digital spaces. In all these examples, we find intersecting relations of race, sexuality, and heteronormative masculinity coming together to associate the protection of sexually defined women as enjoyment objects with the protection of the nation from racialized others. The failure to do so and the potential theft of enjoyment to follow initiates an effective crisis of racialized and national masculinity. The racial other sexual threat to national and racial masculinities, it seems, is a resonant pattern across histories and aesthetics of racism. The cuck meme, however, composes this encounter slightly differently than do the other depictions above. In the cuck meme, enjoyment is not necessarily stolen by force but rather given either by the cuck or the wife. The feminine other is no longer simply a weak and passive figure needing protection but a willing and even conspiring participant in the theft of enjoyment. As Sarah Bannett Weiser observes, one common justification offered by men for misogynistic practices is that they have been wronged by women in some way. Women have taken their jobs. They have emasculated them. They have encroached on sacred masculine spaces. They have refused sexual advances. 2018, 84. The feminine other, presumably a feminist, denies the man enjoyment by choosing to find satisfaction with a different person, the degraded cuck as the other, even, is often a willing participant. He derives, in the eyes of the reactionary subjects, a false and perverse pleasure in deferring the enjoyment he is unable to confer. Within this new composition, the narrative of theft of enjoyment shifts from a binary of inside-stroke-outside formulation, of external invasion of spaces and bodies meant for enjoyment to a more molecular, distributed deferral of enjoyment. The weak man and the feminist woman can join with the racialized other in stealing the enjoyment meant for white masculine consumption. 
In fact, it can be argued that the binary logic of heteronormative sexualization that has been animating previous imaginations of racialized sexuality now becomes a more queer and ambiguous organization of perceived perversity. The queer subjectivity of the cuck exceeds the binary of either or we but 2016, 3, and emerges as a complicated and, for reactionary subjects, a confusing mode of masculinity that differs instead of protects and assumes enjoyment. The self-stroke are the binaries then, the inside stroke outside dualities that stabilize imaginaries of sexuality as enjoyment are, therefore replaced with a perverse arrangement, perverse in the sense of not following heteronormative scripts of sexual enjoyment, the enemy in this imaginary is not only the invading other, it is also the sensuous, feminist woman who gives enjoyment to others and the perverse, feminized man who allows and even enjoys the practice of cuckolding. This queer cup perversity confuses and confounds. Weber 2014, 14, projections of normativity and thereby allows a molecular form of anxiety for reactionary subjects to emerge where cuckoldry becomes a site of obsession and fantasy of theft of enjoyment. Within these fantasies, the pornographic image of the racialized other and his bodily prowess remains as a towering presence. Phallic anxieties, pornographic conspiracies within the popular reactionary image boards of 4chan and 8 Kuhn, a racial and libidinal obsession with cucks and cuckoldry prevails. With just a quick glance, it can be discovered that these boards are widely replete with pornographic meme images of giant black phalluses, disapproving memes of white women holding black babies, and never-ending, often eugenicist, discussions around whether a person or a nation is or has been cucked. These images, often, are not too dissimilar to the fascist posters Thule 1987, on archives. They aesthetically involve and symbolize threatening pairings of white and black bodies and sexually graphic imagery, which mediate various anxieties of sexual otherness. Unlike the historical imaginaries described above, however, the center visual stage in these memes is not all taken by black men. In a meme with the caption White Genocide is Beautiful, figure A3, anonymous 2019, for example, it is the white woman's lustful gaze at the viewer that takes the focus. In Theolite's archival images, women were either depicted as little objects, a sculpture, or lifeless bodies. In this meme, however, the white woman is positioned on top, strong, and sensuous, attesting to a shift in the distribution of enjoyment that grasps the fantasies of reactionary subjects. She has a slight smirk on her face. She is a participant in the enjoyment. In fact, it can be argued that the meme, through her, restages the gaze back that Wilderson conceptualizes in his Afropessimism, 2020, an object meant merely for the pleasure of possession had gazed back at a human subject, 83, the white woman's gaze in. This meme is a gazing back of the object of enjoyment to the cuckolded viewer. Her gaze is also staged hypnotically when read together with the meme's text, white. Genocide is beautiful. The white woman is thus depicted as compelling the viewer to accept the beauty of white genocide. She is both a threat and a sexually hypnotic figure who mediates the anxieties of enjoyment felt by reactionary subjects within her sensuous image and her relation to the black man under her as well as the white audience she gazes at, the multiplicity of affective and aesthetic relations to enjoyment that grasp the reactionary subjects of these boards are brought together through the endless similar memes that are circulated daily in these boards. A particular libidinal economy of the reactionary meme escape emerges through which interrelations of race, gender, and sexuality are multiply felt and mimetically mediated. In addition to the image of the white woman, the black penis stands as a recurring aesthetic in this libidinal economy. Within these spaces, the black penis is ambivalent, it is simultaneously a pornographic, sexualized object of desire and a threatening, violent force. At points, its imagined size and potency are the butt off jokes. One popular meme, which is also resonant outside of these boards, depicting white porn actress Piper Perry surrounded by five muscular, large black men, offers a good example as it aesthetically stages an asymmetrical encounter between 
the infantilized white woman and the violent, sexual, towering presence of black men. The white woman, in these memes, is often a vessel for various political issues such as economic concerns. Figure A4. Know your meme 2019, or military, invasion by a coalition of countries. Figure A5. Know your meme 2018. In her smile and infantilized depiction, she is depicted to be both naive and happy. The meme's comedic effect relies on the contrast between this happy and infantile ignorance and the assumed pornographic violence of the sexual encounter to follow with black men. The me and figure A4, for instance, however happy and innocent, will be overwhelmed by student loans, mortgage, bills, and rent. In figure A5, this narrative is transposed to territorial imaginations of national sovereignty. In this mimetic retelling of the Syrian war, Syria is depicted as the innocent, feminine nation body that will be violently invaded by a coalition of countries than political actors. In the former meme, the naive white woman is not ready for the various violences of life depicted through the virile sexuality of black men. In the latter meme, the violence of militarism is positioned against the naivety of the white woman as a territorial space of enjoyment. The Syrian nation, the black men, comically, are staged as figures of excessive and violent sexuality. The sexualized white woman, on the other hand, welcomes them happily and naively, not knowing the consequences of her actions. By this naive act, she allows the invasion of her body or her country by a swarm of black phalluses through the simple comic narrative of the meme, the racialized and gendered myths of racialized masculinity and femininity are reproduced and recirculated. In it, white women's enjoyment bodies become both sexualized and infantilized and the black other situated against them emerges as phallically threatening and invasive. The meme resonates and becomes enjoyable as it stages various sexual and racial imaginaries and anxieties in relation to each other. Its workings point toward a libidinal economy of racialized enjoyment in the reactionary memescape. Of course, obsession imaginaries with black men and white women are not novel phenomena. In fact, they appear to be the libidinal remnants of a historical colonial encounter. Psychiatrist and philosopher Franz Fanon in his Black Skins White Masks, 2008, has famously analyzed the image in the imaginary of a black penis as an essential component of the colonial psychological apparatus. The white man is convinced that the Negro is a beast. If it is not the length of the penis, then it is the sexual potency that impresses him. Face to face with this man who is different from himself, he needs to defend himself. In other words, to personify the other, the other will become the mainstay of his preoccupations and his desires. Fanon 2008, 131. According to Fanon, the imaginary of the black penis functions to reduce the black colonial other to a biological figure. Within this imaginary, the black penis is both a figure of fascination and a figure of anxiety that carries in this biological con, condition the imminent threat of stealing the enjoyment of the white woman to which the white man feels entitled. The enjoyment composition of the cup thus seems to historically reverberate from the colonial encounter to contemporary reactionary memes. One thing must be mentioned in this connection, a white woman who has had a Negro lover finds it difficult to return to white men, or so at least it is believed, particularly by white men, who knows what they can give a woman. Fallon 2008, 132, within the libidinal economy of the reactionary memescape, this same anxiety is conspiratorially repeated with various mutations. For instance, cuckold pornography in these spaces appears as a constant source of discussion, constructed as a Jewish conspiracy to derail Western civilization by making white men addicted to black penises. The anxiety is again ambivalent. Reactionary subjects are both threatened that the black penis will steal their enjoyment by cucking them, but they are also anxious or even ashamed that they may enjoy these videos themselves. In a conspiracy thread about the so-called endgame of Greg Langsy, the Jewish porn producer of the website Black.com, an anonymous poster, for example, rants, it doesn't even make any money, his endgame is the same of any Jew, he wants white, 
Guys to watch empower their women and like it so it will be normalized to them. And thus lowering the white birth rates across the world. Don't watch it don't be a cuck it's pretty obvious Alan. I don't have financial records for black but where do people get porn? Free sites, so how are they making money from it? They aren't. It's being used as propaganda to turn white men into cucks. Think about Alan or go back to Reddit. Anonymous 2018, 4chan. Within this conspiratorial imaginary, being a cuck is not only a personal condition of weakness attested to some men, but depicted as a wider socio-political project, funded and organized by a Jewish conspiracy to target and entice white man, pervert their modes of supposedly normative enjoyment, and lower white demographics. Importantly, these conspiracies do not remain in these meme board discussions. Peyton Gendron, the 18-year-old shooter, who murdered 10 black people in a shopping mall in Buffalo, United States, for example, has repeated this same conspiratorial fantasy in his manifesto, in which he compiled a large amount of memes taken from 4chan, Gendron 2022, in a section of the manifesto called infographics, pictures, memes, anti-Semitism, he reiterates the board's aesthetic composition of cuckold porn and black porn as a threat to white civilization. The anti-Semitic figure of the happy merchant, in one of the memes, stands on top of a chart visualizing the common ownership of various pornographic sites. Accordingly, the meme situates the mischievous Jewish other as the mastermind. Behind the distribution of enjoyment, figure A6, Gendron 2022, within the aesthetic composition of the cuck, various anxieties, resentments, and reactionary imaginaries of enjoyment come together, become circulated, and eventually make their way to a violent outburst of white supremacist hatred. Being cucked is thus a significant site of resonance in the libidinal economy of the reactionary memescape. From cuck as an insult, to mimified imaginaries about black penises, to conspiratorial thoughts about cuckold porn, the distribution of enjoyment that the cuck meme refers to circulates to express a felt racial anxiety about enjoyment, while the most blatant expressions of these feelings directly deal with the question of racialized sexuality. However, the mutative function of the meme allows this resonance structure of effect to circulate across divergent issues. The revenge of the nerds, gamagot, masculinity, and the feminist killjoy. The gamagot events of 2014 are often regarded as the digital originator, or at least the mainstreamer of the cuck meme, know your meme 2015, in addition to being a significant moment in the widespread development of the reactionary memoscape. The Gamagut events were a series of misogynistic digital harass meant campaigns that started against a female game developer, Zoe Quinn, whose ex-partner Aaron Joni posted an article alleging her sexual involvement with various video game journalists in exchange for favorable reviews of her games. While this allegation was demonstrably false. The article stoked outrage amongst a critical mass of video game players who felt threatened by the growing presence and influence of women as both players and industry participants. Salter 2018, 247. The Gamergate hashtag and a host of memes and discussions about what the participants in the harassment articulated as the problem of ethics in gaming journal. Isom quickly spread from 4chan to subreddits such as Arcotic in action to more mainstream platforms such as Twitter and YouTube in months following the allegations. Erin Gijoni, amid these months-long conversations, was quickly labeled a beta cuck for being cheated on by Quinn. Gijoni, himself, in fact, embraced the mantle, at one point calling himself a devilishly attractive beta cuck. Plus, 2014. In a Reddit AMA thread, on the 25th of August, Yupa Cryas 2014, Kajoni also posted a photoshopped meme referencing the TV cartoon DuckTales, Cucktales, figure A7, Know Your Meme 2015, Kajoni, throughout the saga, became a figurehead for the cuck imaginary through which the various sexual and social anxieties of gamers could be mediated. He was cut, and therefore, he became injured by a self-proclaimed feminist in being cheated on. Furthermore, however, he was also 
cupped in wrongly allowing the penetration of an unwelcomed feminist presence to an enjoyment space that was constructed as masculine. In this ambivalent relation, Kajoni's memeification as a cup connected the personal romantic stroke sexual and the social video gaming, while the Gamakut saga, on the surface, pertained to a backlash following. Joni's article accusing Quinn of sexual involvement with video game journalists. The events engendered a wider network of reactionary expressions of what Sarah Bannett Weezer calls a geek masculine injury. 2018, 151. The resonance of the cuck emerged from the collective sensibility of this injury. Geek masculinity is a recently globalized construction of masculine identity, predominantly amongst white, middle class, and heterosexual men that privileges aptitude, knowledge, and interest in cheek. Subjects such as video games, computers, and cult movies instead of traditional hypermasculine identifiers such as strength and athleticism, Bell 2015, keep masculine spaces are often enclosed spaces of specialized interests that imagine women as either non-existent or as a fetishized category of an ideal minority, the real geek women. The social structure of geek masculinity revolves around a particular enjoyment relation to the collective consumption of geek commodities through which the geek identity is consolidated. Within this relation, the geek subject makes a form of property claim to various geek commodities as he financially, socially, and effectively invests in them. These various investments are then collectively shared in enjoyment spaces of geek masculine camaraderie, forums, chatboards, streaming, communitis, etc., along with a continual production of memes and commentary about them. In this geek masculine configuration, enjoyment is therefore not simply defined sexually but through a spatial and property right to enjoy geek commodities and spaces of camaraderie. This right entails a claim to sovereignty, both subjective and territorial, whereby geek men, by the virtue of their collective invest, men's Assume exclusivity with regard to the enjoyment of true cheekiness. In a related analysis, Jack Bratich argues that what he calls autogenetic sovereignty, 2022, 29, defines the social cultural production of modern digital masculinity and misogyny. Autogenetic sovereignty refers to the masculine myth and fantasy of autonomous and abstract subjective existence outside material sociality, especially one defined through and by dependence on woman and femininity. It desires the enjoyment of a transcendental life where men can be sovereign over themselves and master property and territory relations through which they can make themselves autonomous. The feminine other emerges as a figure of threat as a generator of social dependence that grounds masculine sovereignty. For Bratich, this is the gist of the sovereign dynamic. The autogenetic maneuver requires that the original woman be rejected and denigrated as the ambassador of the mutable world from which he seeks to assert his independence and over which he strives to establish his superiority. 30. While the configuration of this sovereign impulse takes multiple forms in geek masculinity, this impulse is established through a digital territorial claim to geek spaces as rightful spaces of enjoyment that allows the masculine self, otherwise denigrated in traditionally masculine circles, to be autonomous and masterful in his superior understanding of an investment in geek properties and practices. The feminine or rather feminist SJW other, exemplified in the figure of Zoe Quinn, threatens this flight to geek masculine sovereignty by bringing politics into games, politics defined primarily through femininity and feminist issues thereby interrupting the supposedly transcendental space of pure geek enjoyment and grounding it in sociality. Within this dynamic, Bannard Weiser finds the source of geek masculine injury. The injury is that masculinity has been lost, and the role of popular misogyny is to find and restore it. 2018, 126, or perhaps, enjoyment as defined through geek masculinity is being stolen and it needs to be restored. The effective resonance of the Kukmeen during Gamakut, it can be argued, thus staged itself in relation to the investments, expectations, and anxieties of a particular mode of geek masculine injury. The sexual dynamics of Kukultry between Quinn and Kujoni became imaginary substitutes for emergent social dynamics. 
around feminist presence of women in video game communities, as Salter argues, gamer hostility to Quinn was animated by an escalating sense of defensiveness amongst gamers who object to growing criticisms of the excesses of their subculture and preferred games. The counter response from gamers has been to claim that women and their progressive allies are colluding with journalists and other critics to politicize video games and destroy gamer subculture. Salter 2018, 253. The events themselves were often felt by the geeks involved as a theft of enjoyment narrative, a disruption to the sovereign enjoyment of games as property and gaming spaces as territorial relation. Gamogators often discussed their disdain for SJWs who supposedly threatened their enjoyment of not just gaming, but culture at large. Mazanery in Chess 2018, 524. The threat to this territorial and property enjoyment was then defended with exclusionary and eliminationist practices aimed at disposing SJW elements from spaces of enjoyment as they have crossed borders and became violators of sacred masculine space, for example, gaming, Bratich, 2022, pages 46 to 7, a good example of this effective imaginary is present in an image that was posted in 4chan and then widely circulated across the reactionary memoscape, figure A8, at still grey 2014, SJW game journalists, this image claims, want to ruin our hobby, playing video games, with their culture of shaming and censoring anyone who disagrees with them, in ruining the hobby SJWs seem to steal enjoyment as collectively, owned by a particular geek masculine self, our hobby, within this imaginary, the cucking of Grjoni intersects and overlaps with the cucking of video games, Grjoni's position becomes ambivalent, he is simultaneously a figure of humiliation who allowed the invasion of SJW women into gaming as an exclusive enjoyment space and a sympathetic figure who represents the injury of peak masculinity whose enjoyment was stolen by a feminist Killjoy Ahmed 2010, the figure of the cuck within the social relations of the event, thus brought together these ambivalences to give shape to the various anxieties and resentments of reactionary subjectivity. Why is Sweden so cupped? The queer perversity of masochist nations, the racial and gendered politics that animate the cup meme, finally, moves from these personal and social circulations to the site of international relations. Through this movement, the enjoyment distribution that defines the figure of the cup becomes transposed to the anthropomorphized nation across the reactionary memoscape. We find an emergent circulation of memes, discussions, and various political narratives that revolve around nations or entire races becoming demo, graphically cut by international immigration from the global south and or becoming sexually weakened by cuckolded male politicians and feminists that threaten the rightful masculinity of the nation stroke race. Anthropomorphic depictions of abstract or non-human entities are popular. Modes of communicating political differentiations in the memoscape, the anthropomorphic function often works to condense immediate complex political phenomena into easily consumable, spreadable, and mutable aesthetic products, through which various effective identifications can be forged. Nations are one of the most frequently anthropomorphized and meme political entities in the memoscape. See the popular country bulls meme. These mimetic nation Imaginaries often allow national identifications, ideologies, and differences to be digitally circulated, reiterated, and reified in comic form through their mundane circulations and resonances. These anthropomorphized memes then become performative, aesthetic tools for the constitution of national identities and subjectivities. The transposition of the distribution of enjoyment that the cuck meme circulates to national and racial imaginaries also involves the anthropomorphization of such nations with embodied sexual and affective characteristics. This aesthetic move allows the left off enjoyment narratives to become translated from bodily, personal, and social interactions to national and international relations. Through the anthropomorphic gesture, it is now the nation often identified with a particular racial and civilizational identity that becomes cut of its enjoyment as the cup meme moves from the personal stroke social to anthropomorphized international relations 
it interacts with a host of gendered and racialized narratives about nationhood, nationality, and national sovereignty to structure its effective resonance. Feminist, Peterson 1992, Nagel 1998, Aegis 2022, and Queer Weeper 1998, 2016, Griffin 2007, Rao 2018, Scholarship in International Relations has comprehensively dissected how particular gendered and heteronormative figurations encode the ways in which nations and international relations are imagined and performed into being. At points, these gendered imaginaries of the nation take the familiar binary of an abstract, detached, and sovereign figure of the masculine state that protects a natural, embodied feminine nation. This imaginary points toward a gendered enjoyment relation. The enjoyment of the feminine nation passes through the protective activities of the masculine state. This same imaginary also involves its own sexually racialized others. While the national self is constituted through N, enjoyment, negatively racialized nations are structured as sexually perverse Weeper, 2016, as having a false form of enjoyment in her terrorist assemblages, 2017, for instance, Jasbir Poor argues that nations that are constructed as terrorists are off. Ten seen through a perversely queer lens, their own sexuality apparently, making them racially incompatible with civilization and marking them for political v. Ollens. In relation to these narratives, nations are imagined through a series of enjoyment distributions. While some nations enjoy rightfully, others do not. While some nationalities are to enjoy, others are threats to enjoyment. In the reactionary memoscape, this sexual economy of the nation becomes chiefly mediated through the racialized circulation of the cup meme. The relationship between the heterosexist, gendered imagination of national sovereignty as the enjoyment of the feminine nation and cucking as loss of enjoyment plays a central role in how racial anxieties of replacement around immigration and demographic change are felt and circulated in reactionary spaces. Nations allowing migration are depicted as cuts. In a way, the cucking of the nation becomes a queering of the heteronormative nation as the site of enjoyment, instead of the heterosexist ideal of the masculine state as having a sovereign relationship of enjoyment over the feminine nation. The feminized queer state takes a perverse joy in giving out the enjoyment of the nation to sexually racialized others through this false perversity, accordingly. The nation no longer becomes the rightful owners to enjoy. In becoming queerly cut, the nation loses its rightful enjoyment and becomes perverse. The reactionary narrative resonates at the level of this perversity. It sees itself in reactive relation to an emergent national perversity. Serious question, how did Europe get so cut? Asks a user on the conservative. Subreddit R stroke ask the Donald. ISIS fighters returning to Sweden and getting housing and welfare. What's a real alternate universe did I wake up in? If I can't even comprehend the level of masochism they seem to think is perfectly normal, how can I begin to tell them how cupped they are? N. Para, deleted, 2017. In reactionary circulations of the memoscape, Europe, in particular Nordic countries, emerge as the epitome of cuckoldry, partly in relation to their welfare states and relatively lenient immigration programs. Not only do they give housing and welfare to ISIS fighters, the poster questions, but according to him, this attests to a level of masochism. The use of the term masochism implies that these cup nations attain a perverse, queer, and false form of enjoyment from what this poster sees as a humiliating set of immigration policies. Within the logic of the post, the cup Sweden fails to protect the heterosexist nation border from perverse terrorist fighters. Manchander 2015, and willingly and enjoyably gives them housing and welfare, property that should be enjoyed by the true Swedes. This failure marks Sweden as a cup nation, unable to enjoy nationhood properly. The imaginary of this failure mutates across the reactionary memoscape to structure a particular image of Sweden in a mutative reimagining of Crotone's cup tales. Meme, for instance, Sweden is depicted as being cupped by the overwhelming presence of black and brown people, figure A9, 4chan, the tolerant female figure, and the cuck male Swede stand atop of the racialized others, welcoming them with 
Open arms. The swarm is interspersed with images of two recurrent figures, the lamentful elder man and the crying white child, respectively, representing the past and future of white race whose rightful enjoyment is stolen. The figures of the hypersexual black man, the queer cook, and the sensuous white woman move across the mimetic circulation of Sweden's perceived cuckoldry. This imaginary, again, is ambivalent. The queerness of the cup Swede, in figure A10, anonymous, 2017 B, for example, manifests in enjoying and attaining pleasure from the wrong gender and race. The humiliated Swede fails to sexually enjoy the traditional white Swedish woman and instead dreams of an is sexually stimulated by two black men. His sexuality is perverted across lines of gender and race. In a different meme, figure A11, you stroke chicken hog 2019, the cuckold imagery is now more literal, staging a graphic scene where the Swedish man attends to housework specifically writing, refugees welcome and cup to a shed, while his wife is with a black man, instead of the perverse queer enjoyment, however, the cupped male is resentful, depicted in between facial expressions of crying and anger, in the ambivalent oscillations of these two memes, Sweden emerges as both queer and resentful. Their rightful enjoyment is both given by the queer cuck who enjoys falsely and stolen by the racialized other and by the feminist woman who enjoyed while the white man attends to housework. This ambivalent distribution of enjoyment, it can be argued, sustains a racial reactionary figuration whereby the self simultaneously identifies with the cuck as a source of resentment but also detests the queer cuck for his degenerate perversion. Its particular distribution makes possible the reactionary narrative, we are cucked off our enjoyment by refugees and migrants, and we need to do something about it, and that there are degenerate cucks among us who defer our enjoyment and need to be eliminated. The meme sustains and soaks up the ambivalence imminent to the racialized sensibilities of a felt loss of enjoyment. It horizontally stages an restages a transversal and resonant effective atmosphere of resentment that percolates the memescape resentments around enjoyment which are transformed into small enjoyable bits of digital aesthetics loosely assemble and bring together reactionary subjectivities at the level of the international conclusion traversing the personal the social and the international the cuck meme is a resonant digital aesthetic product that offers us a window into the effect of done discursive positioning and logics of reactionary sensibilities in contemporary global politics. It is a mutated continuation of a historically situated mode of white masculine subjectivity that structures itself around a normative and perceived right to enjoy us. A socio-effective machinery intimately related to distributed property regimes and their various exclusions, tracing the continuities between the right to enjoy us a historical regime of subjectivity and its contemporary specters that haunt the seemingly and potentially transgressive space of the memescape. This paper showed how the anxieties around the perceived loss of a normatively expected enjoyment is a significant point of resonance in the political imaginaries and resentments of reactionary subjectivities today. It demonstrated how the transversal circulation of the cuck meme from pornographic anxieties against the myth of the hypersexual racial, other to geek masculine injuries of commodified enjoyment space to international resentments around migration, composes a shared structure of feeling around a felt theft of enjoyment that animates and accelerates the political desires and emotions of these subjects. Recognizing the role played by this felt loss of enjoyment in the composition of contemporary reactionary subjectivity, furthermore, offers additional insight into why reactionary politics becomes so attractive to some white masculine subjects in the first place. Extant analyses of populism, reaction, and far-right digital spaces off ten focus on the prevalence of so-called negative feelings in the effective composition of these movements, hatred, anger, disgust, etc. Marlon Bennett and Jackson, 2022 to the extent that these feelings are present. However, it is also equally significant to consider how enjoyment as a positive feeling, both in its loss and in its reclamation, mediates and structures the embodiment of these hateful sensibilities, in contrast to what becomes perceived and felt as a shrinking enjoyment space. The seemingly transgressive, excessive, 
and vulgar sites of enjoyment provided by reactionary and far-right politics present a fantasy of violent reclamation of the normatively expected people become vulnerable to right-wing appeals not because they don't know enough about the situation but because they experience a deficit in enjoyment that the appeals rectify by allowing them to access enjoyment through the figure of the enemy McGowan 2022 64 as Anderson and Secor argue this contemporary reactionary politics offers the intensity of a violent fun against a background of potential boredom 2022 one in light of this it should not be surprising to see that the manifesto of attacker Peyton Gendron explains how he started browsing 4chan in May 2020 after extreme boredom 2022 the spectacularly carnivalesque politics of what Goffman calls the Trump Carnival 2018 or the everyday sadisms and trollish cruelties that congregate quotidian digital expressions Meville 2015 are both exemplary processes of this reclamatory fantasy. It is through becoming observant to this interplay between the perceived left off enjoyment and its violent reclamations that we can begin to understand and move against the subjective and effective politics of the reactionary memoscape. This would require first to attend to how we structure enjoyment as a political factor at the intersecting levels of the personal, the social, and the international. What? histories and expectations they connect to, and how its remnants become mobilized by appeals that seem to offer a solution. Second, and a more difficult project, it would require formulating and mobilizing an alternative politics of enjoyment. This would be an enjoyment that is not mediated racially nor in gendered terms, through the structuring sense of property and ownership, but one that is relationally and collectively embodied. Brown 2019, it would have to demonstrate that Enjoyment is neither scarce nor conditioned exclusively by someone else's lack but flourishes and expands when it is shared. Finally, it would have to offer the vision for a future where enjoyment is not so bound by and for the nation, but as an effective force that can transcend its boundaries. As Lindsay Gall argues in her radical happiness 2017, we need to claim the spaces and places out there in the world where it becomes easier to escape our own personal dilemmas, enjoying collective moments of pleasure. 16. If the reactionary memoscape brings a site of connection for this reclamatory fantasy, perhaps moving toward a memoscape that offers the beginning of this alternative politics of enjoyment can be imagined as a source of action laden with other possibilities.